Hey, Northview, I want to welcome all of our campuses this weekend, but a big shout out goes to our newest campus, Indy North. Today is the grand opening weekend, and we couldn't be more excited for what God is going to do on the north side of the city. This weekend, we also launch a brand new five-week series called Healing is a Choice. It's based on the book by the same title, and today the author, Stephen Arterburn, is here to kick it off. You may have heard his name before because Stephen Arterburn is a famous radio host as well as a best-selling author. He's known for the Every Man's Battle series of books, The Seven Minute Married Solution, as well as Healing is a Choice. In addition, Steve is also the founder of Women of Faith Conferences, as well as New Life Ministries. You might have even seen him on Oprah or Good Morning America. What you may not know is that Steve and his wife Misty are a part of our congregation. They live in Fishers with their four children, and we have become great friends. So Northview, would you give a warm welcome to our own Steve Arterburn? Thank you. Thank you very much. It is so, <laughs> it is so scary to be here. There are over, <laughs> over 100 people in here, I'm telling you, and it's amazing. But uh, it's so great to get to know Steve and Sandy Poe and to see that, you know, people in leadership are, they're living what they're teaching, and they certainly are. And, of course, I'm excited because I preached here on, uh, right after Thanksgiving, and then I got asked back. And that rarely happens, so that's a cool thing for me. But uh, before we get started, I just, um, you know, I, um, well, I want to um, talk about the Bronco, the elephant in the room here. It is uh, Super Bowl Sunday. And I don't know what you're wearing. I've selected my uh, championship shirt here and uh, really excited about to get that on later on. But uh, I wanted to get all of the football analogies out of the way right up front so we didn't have to deal with that later on. So as we kick off this new series, some of you have blocked God, you've been defensive with your spouse, offensive in your behavior, maybe you've fumbled a lot, you want to give up, you just want to punt. Well, no Hail Mary is going to get you out of that situation. Maybe as a single free agent, when you're on a date, it's too easy to get off sides, out of bounds. Uh, maybe you're guilty of some personal fouls, touchbacks okay, but no backfield in motion. And so uh, maybe uh, if you're filling out your taxes, there are some illegal procedures you need to give up this year. If you're married and miserable, you want to be traded. Maybe you think you're in the wrong huddle. Maybe you're not playing according to God's playbook. Maybe you're lost. You've underperformed. You feel like you're going to be cut. Well, maybe you're just sitting on the sidelines, and God would really like you to be part of the special teams here at the church. Maybe God needs you to center, but you're too busy being your own quarterback, or maybe you want to coach everybody else out there. Well, maybe you're tired of faking it or just rushing from one thing to another. You need a reverse, and maybe that could be the beginning right here. All you care about is halftime, Beyonce. So maybe this is the time <laughs> to, to get in there and tackle the giants in your life. You think when it comes to God's love, you're an ineligible receiver. No, and God doesn't just want to penalize you. He's got so much for you. But the play clock is ticking. Maybe you went to the doctor this week. You got the two-minute warning, and you don't know where you're going to end up, whose end zone you're going to be in at the end of life. Well, there is no overtime when it's all over. And maybe it's time to get in the game or to stop playing games, and maybe God has brought you here today because he wants to draft you onto his team. Amen. All right, there it is. I did it. Now. Today we start a five-week series, and there are 10 choices, choices that I had to make to get out of the worst place in my life. And I had some great people coming along helping me make these choices. And it's all based on the fifth chapter of John where, you know, Jesus could have been anywhere he wanted to be. And on that day, he chooses to be at this healing pool, the pool of Bethesda. Now, there are these uh, terraces where all these sick people are. First time I, I gave this, I mispronounced it. I said they, there are these terrorists all around, but it's terraces and sick people. And you can imagine what that was like, moaning, the sounds of people dying or sick, the open, gaping wounds and the stench of rotting flesh. And that's where Jesus decided to be on that day. All these people, so sick and miserable. Let's look at what it says here, John 5, 5 through 6. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? 
I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up, you know. Someone else is always there getting in there ahead of me. Now, isn't that just typical? The divine creator of the universe, God's son, Jesus Christ, comes along, invites everybody to experience. Maybe he wouldn't say, do you want to be healed to you? But he'd say, do you want to live differently? Do you want things to be better? Do you want something to change? And we start babbling about bubbles and all sorts of other things and making excuses, and God's just saying, hey, I don't care about that. Do you want to be well? So he offers an invitation, and he gets some lame excuses. But on that day, that man picked up his mat, and he walked. You know, I just think so often we We don't want to pick up our mat and walk. We don't want to do anything. What we want is we want God to fix us. We want the quick fix, the instant solution. We want a miracle. But i got to tell you, they call them miracles because they don't happen very often. If, if If they did, we'd call them things that happen all the time rather than call them miracles. And so we sit around and we do nothing waiting for God to do what maybe God is waiting for us to do. We want him to act. We want him to show up and to do something spectacular, and then we will believe. Well, back in 155, there was a man born named Clement of Alexandria. Friends called him Clem, and he wrote this. It was amazing. Sounds like it was written yesterday. He says, spiritual faith does not come about by saying, show me a sign, God. Answer my prayer. Perform a miracle. It begins by believing simply that God is and that he is above his creation. The disciple of the Lord must train himself to see, hear, speak, and act spiritually. Therefore, we do not insist that God answers prayers or bless us in order to prove that he is Lord. That's fleshly-minded darkness and a counterfeit form of the faith. Learn how to walk in the true faith, which rests in God, not demanding earthly answers and blessings. Do not slip down into a false earthly faith which must rest upon these signs and miracles in order to stand at all. God's love is miracle enough, and yet we hold on to our excuses. Well, I've tried everything, or, well, you know, this is about as much as I'm willing to do. I might be uncomfortable if I made a change. People might not like me anymore. And all of that prevents us from walking the way that God wants us to walk. It's amazing how every day we construct our future by the choices we make or do not make. There's an old Jewish proverb, and it says, no choice today is the more accurate predictor of more miserable tomorrows than the choice to do nothing. Peter Drucker said, behind every success story, you find someone who made a courageous decision. And if you're going to change, if something is going to be different, you have to make a courageous decision. Here's the reality. We come into church, we, we, we don't really want people to know what's going on with us. But something's going on with everybody. My mother used to say three little sayings that kind of encapsulated everything. It's always something. If it's not one thing, it's another, and you never know. That's what she'd say. Because it is. It's always something. She, was, uh, she ran three beauty salons to put me and my brother through school, and then she got sick, came home from the doctor, and said, well, I have the one thing you wouldn't want to have if you were doing what I do. I am allergic to hairspray. And then she said, it's always something. And then she'd say, if it's not one thing, it's another. I'd say, if it's not one thing, it was my mother. But she didn't like that at all. (laughs) We think, well, if I just didn't have this, but if you didn't have this, you'd have that. Life's like dancing with a gorilla. You are not done until the gorilla is done. And there's always going to be something coming along. And if there's not one thing, it's another. And then you never know. We think we know, but we don't know. I read this story about these Japanese fishermen. They were out in the Indian Ocean. They were fishing, and their boat was sunk by a cow. They were all out paddling around. This Russian trawler comes up and figured out that what the Japanese guys were saying, that a cow had struck their boat in the middle of the ocean. So they take them back to land. They find out what happened. 
there was a Russian cargo plane. It was on the tarmac, and a steer had gotten loose, so they roped it, put it in the cargo hold. At 30,000 feet, the steer broke loose. They were afraid it was going to puncture the hydraulic lines, so they just opened the cargo door, and boom, talk about a cow dropping. There it went. I mean, just right down. There it was. It's amazing. Hit, hit the boat. I mean, prove it. You could be in the Indian Ocean, be hit by a cow. You never know. There was a man fishing. He, he was fishing in the Pacific Ocean. Leans back, yawns. A flying fish jumps up out of the water, lodges into his throat, chokes him to death, and he dies right there. You could be fishing and be choked to death by a little bitty fish, proving you never know. We think we know. And so since we don't know, maybe this would be the time to make some choices that could make all the difference in the world. One of the problems is that we come into church with some toxic teaching. You know, you turn on Christian television, you see these people with the big hair. It's just phenomenal. I don't know what that's all about. They say, if you got faith as big as my hair, nobody has faith that big. <laughs> you know, you just have enough faith, everything's going to work out, be healed instantly, all this stuff. It's just not true. Everybody's got this quick fix, this instant solution, and many times there's no fix. And there's no solution. And this is nothing new. Listen to what uh, Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 6.13. From the least to the greatest, their lives are ruled by greed. From prophets to priests, they are all frauds. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wound. They give assurances of peace when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their disgusting actions? No, not at all. They don't even know how to blush. So there are all these people that want to give us this quick fix hope and make it like the only reason we haven't had this miraculous thing is because we just don't have enough faith. I want to tell you, reality is we're all struggling in some way. If you go to one of the... uh, wonderful life groups, you're going you're gonna to hear some stories, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play one for you here in a minute. But you're going to hear about divorce, and, and you're going to hear about paying for an abortion, and borderline personality disorder, and alcoholism, and addiction, and affairs. Not because Northview endorses or encourages any of that, but what they endorse and what they encourage is Healing. And that's what God offers us. Healing is a choice. When I was writing this book, I said, you know, uh, to my wife, healing is a choice. And she said, my wife said, yeah, it's God's choice. And I said, oh, yeah, let's don't forget that. But there are things we have to do to experience that choice. It's like the Israelites, you know. God said, here's your promised land. There's some giants there. You need to go conquer the giants in the promised land to experience it and live in it. We have our own giants that we need to conquer, and that's why we're not experiencing what God wants for us. And so, when we start to do what God wants us to do, when we stop waiting for Him to do what He's waiting for us to do, then we get to experience the healing and the resolution and the fulfilled life that He's been, um, been looking for and that he's laid out for us. Well, the first choice that we're going to deal with is the choice to feel your life. And, and it's tricky, this feelings thing. I was looking at some titles of books, those ugly emotions, <laughs> deadly emotions, emotions, can you trust them? And my favorite, a woman's forbidden emotions. What are those? Could someone, tell me? I don't know what that is, but I would love to know what they are. Well, when we encounter emotions that we are uncomfortable with, we do some pretty defective and destructive, uh, some, some very distinct things that cause us to miss all that God has for us. Watch this courageous woman who goes to this church, Elisa. Watch this story as she tells you what happens in her life.
In my early childhood, I had a stepdad that was extremely violent, would fly into rages, and we eventually had to run for our lives. And um, we were able to escape and, you know, be able to live in the same town, normal lives. Um, but that, that time in my life impacted me as an adult in ways that I don't think that I fully understood until I could spend some time really processing and looking back. Uh, as an adult, I was very angry. I was fearful, you know, often of men, other people, you know, are they abusive? Are they safe? Um, am I in a safe place? How do I know? And uh, I often kind of hid from the world and wanted to stay in my own little bubble. As I became a young woman, I definitely sought love in all the wrong places. I was desperate to be loved by a man and uh, stayed in relationships that I probably should have gotten out of because I wanted to be loved and I thought that was love. I thought abuse was love. And I thought that was kind of how things are supposed to be. And then I came across my husband and I think from the moment I laid eyes on him, that was all she wrote. I found out I was pregnant early on and then we, he asked me to marry him and we were married, so oh, I was 20 years old. Kind of the bottom dropped out of my whole life when uh, we had our third child and uh, I had a really fun group of friends that I partied with. We pretty much got into the scene of drinking pretty heavy. That was kind of oh, what I really turned to for uh, the emotional pain. I had no tools or resources to know how to cope with emotional pain, but alcohol seemed to do just fine. When you're partying with friends and getting totally wasted out of your mind, you don't really think about it too much. And then when you're at home and you're doing the daily life and you're starting to think about it, well, have another glass of wine and then another and then another until you just can't remember anymore. And I realized I have to get better. I have to figure out how to live this life. And I had no idea what I was gonna do. Feeling feelings without being able to drink is excruciating. That is so painful. And I would be fine until I had emotional pain. You know, when the emotional pain came either from my past or conflict with my kids or even my husband or friends, that was bad. Um, I really had nowhere to go but to the Lord. I said, okay, God, you know, my way hasn't gotten me any kind of healing that I, I need, so we'll try it your way. I decided to quit drinking, got all the alcohol out of my house, all the alcohol glasses, wine glasses. And it was kind of through that process that then the Lord just kind of kept leading me, you know, further and further along uh, into relationship with Him. And eventually, through the process of, you know, connection, safe people, Bible study, and the Lord, I did find that there was hope that if you stick with the process of allowing the Lord to heal you, there is healing, there is hope. Now that is courage, to just throw that out there. And you heard her say, feeling feelings without being able to drink is excruciating. You may not drink, but is it food? Is it work? Is it lying? Is it uh, busyness? Is it sex? Is it romance? What is it that you use maybe the way she used drinking? That's what we all have to deal with sooner or later. Um, you know, so courageous in a culture where we don't want anybody in church to know what's going on. You know what? It would be better if when you, you came to church, you opened up the little program there, the bulletin, and your whole story was just written out there for everybody to read. Can you imagine that? That would be better than for you to go through life 
And no one ever fully knows what you're going through or what you've been through. Because that's really what the church is about, is being able to be open and honest with each other because it's a safe place. Now, I want to show you a picture of my loving, nurturing wife. Um, I, I, I have to, I'm going to tell a story here. And, and so this is, she's strong. And so I got to be really careful because this isn't the most flattering story. But I told her, I asked her about it. She's got this recoverygirls.com thing she's doing. She's going to post this story there. But uh, we were dating and she was driving uh, her Ford Taurus. And this little thing came up on the dash board, engine maintenance required. And I, you know, I just going along there. I go, hey, look at that. That's something. And uh, she said, yeah, I've got to take this in, get that light fixed. I thought, okay, all right, yeah, get that thing fixed. And I thought, you know, I don't know, maybe uh, it's something wrong with the engine. You know, the light's saying, it. shouldn't that? It's the light. <laughs> well, a couple of days later, she was going down the road and uh, produced a fabulous amount of smoke coming out of the back of that car, and then boom, and it wouldn't go. Uh, the block had cracked because uh, it was out of oil. <laughs> she just didn't have any oil in it. And uh, just in case you're curious, $2,500 for a uh, new or used uh, Ford Taurus engine there. Now, uh, I'm just, I got to get this right here. She's She's a beautiful person. She's a brilliant person, high IQ. The two bonus boys that she brought into the marriage, Carter and James, they're brilliant. So I just want to say this was a very weak moment for her. Uh, she doesn't have many of these weak moments. But the point is we do that all the time. We have this feeling. It's a warning light saying something's not right here. And what do we do? Do we go and, and, and try to fix the problem? No. We kill the feeling. We try to go get the light to turn off. You know, most people have a Bible, and either in the middle or at the bottom, it's got these cross-referenced verses. You know, you're reading something in the New Testament, and they'll say, hey, if you go over here in the Old Testament, well, here's something that'll help you understand it better. Every feeling needs to be cross-referenced back to what is the source of that? What's wrong? Usually, if you're angry at a man here, uh, there's somebody back there you were really angry at. And so it's important that we not kill the messenger, that we act on it and do so. Yeah, you can take that down now. Uh, ooh, scary. Day. We go to bed at night. I pat her down, make sure she's not packing heat. <laughs> it's just kind of ooh, strong. All right. So, so what is it that we are doing when we're on empty? Because every time you're empty, oil, whatever, Satan says, fill her up. Food, sex, drugs, work, whatever it is, he wants us to do anything but resolve that emotion. You know, we, uh, we protect uh, our image. We don't want to admit anything we're going through. If I ask people, if you have some anger in your life, people will say, yeah, or you, you have some guilt, oh, a little bit of that. Uh, but nobody will admit they're afraid. And I think it's the most underrated emotion. And we just go through and, and we, we fake it. And the Bible is just full of emotion. And Jesus, you know, he wept uh, at the death of Lazarus. And, and he swept the temple clean out of anger. And he sweat drops of blood. Look, look at uh, Mark 14, It says, he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. The first big lie that we, we encounter in the Christian world is real Christians ought to have a real peace about everything. Hey, that's not peace. Jesus wasn't real peaceful about everything. And so often, you know, somebody will go through this devastating time. Someone will die or, or they'll lose a, a, a father, a husband or something like that. And they're in the depths of despair. And some Christian will come along and say, well, I know that you must have a real peace about that. Oh, shut up. What are you? Is that what people need to hear? I know a woman, her husband died of cancer. And a woman came up and said, well, now. Jesus can be your husband. Oh, really? Is that what that woman needed to hear? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You, it's biblical. I'm going to show you the verse. You can slap somebody that says something stupid. <laughs> no, look, hey, Proverbs 18, 7, a fool's mouth calls for blows. 
So somebody, some Christian says something stupid like that, just hit them right across the face. And ask them if they're a Christian. If they're a Christian, then say, well, then you'll want to turn the other cheek, and then you just slap them again. We've got to, you know, sometimes we just ought to be shut up as Christians here. Because, you know, real peace, uh, oh, my goodness. I, I'll tell you, you want to be, have some real peace. Uh, be psychotic. I mean, you know, psychotic people can have some real peace. Did you know where they, they've done testing? The people that have the highest self-esteem, they're really at peace with themselves. Are people in prison. Isn't that interesting? I mean, if you take medication, uh, you know, like heroin, something like that, uh, that, that'll give you some peace for a little while. So there are all sorts of false pieces that we can get into, and our life is literally in peace. But, but look, at, look at what Paul says and how he uses and addresses a lack of peace in a letter that he wrote. He says, well, I'm no longer sorry that I sent you that letter, though I was sorry for a time, for I know that it was painful to you for a little while. Well, now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to have remorse and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek salvation. We will never regret that kind of sorrow. But sorrow without repentance is the kind that results in death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such readiness to punish the wrongdoer. You showed that you have done everything you could to make things right. You see, sorrow and shame and things like that, they, they're feelings that God wants to use to alter our behavior. Someone was talking to me about uh, every man's battle, and uh, you know, when it came out uh, 15 years ago, they said, you know, that was the big thing, and you were able to address it. They said, what's the next big thing? I said, maybe the next big thing is that there's no next big thing that nobody feels remorse. Nobody cares. Nobody has any sense of shame whatsoever. Maybe that's the next big thing. Because God wants to use these things for us to change. He wants to do things so that we deal with the reality of our lives. So we need to use our feelings, not hide them, not cover them up. When our boy Solomon was born, right before he was born, my wife was eight months pregnant. We went to Babies R Us, which I call Prophets R Up. <laughs> we bought this chest. It was quite heavy, and so they had a guy from shipping come out, big old guy, I don't know his name, Thor, something like that. And so <laughs> Thor, he helps me uh, lift this chest into the back of the truck. But right before we set it down, he just slams it up down on the, on the floor of the truck, and, and my finger, this one right here, the one I lost the nail from, was underneath that chest. And Thor looks at me and says, did that hurt? <laughs> I said, no. Come on. No, I'm fine. He walks back around the corner. I start dancing around. Oh, I am saying things you might not find in the Old or the New Testament. <laughs> My pregnant wife walks up. I said something stupid like pain worse than childbirth. And uh, it, I've said worse than that. By the way, God did give that childbirth pain to the right gender, didn't he? I'm telling you. Women, they, they take something the size of a watermelon, pass it through something the size of a garden hose. They're up cooking dinner that night. Us men, we pass a kidney granule. They call them kidney stones to make us feel better. Little granules. We're out for a week on that. So anyway, they got the, got the right gender on that. But I just thought, when, you know, I did not want to reveal to Thor, God of pain, that I was hurting. And that's the way, that's human nature. First reaction, cover it up. And God says, come on, I can do something with it. Another translation of Jeremiah 6.14 is, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. And we do it all the time. Well, the second choice in these 10 choices is the choice to investigate the truth and to search for the truth in your life. Lamentations 3.40 says, let us examine our ways. 
And, you know, in the 12 steps, you come to the fourth step, and it asks you or invites you to do a searching and fearless inventory. I was down in the Polk County, Florida uh, jail, and this woman who was there on methamphetamines says to me, the reason I'm here is that I'm never willing to do that fourth step. But it's, it's a time where we can kind of clear up some, some blind spots. Helen Keller said, the saddest thing of all are people who have eyes, but they are blind. We can see everybody else's problem, but it's hard for us to see our own. This couple walked into an art gallery, and they were in the lobby there, and there was this beautiful frame, and this old grumpy guy looks up and says to his wife, well, that is, that is really ugly. That is so depressing. Why would they even have that in an art gallery? She said, honey, that's a mirror. <laughs> we need some mirrors in our lives to show us the reality of, of our defects, not just what other people are doing wrong. We miss the truth about ourselves. The alcoholic sees, oh, I can quit any time, moderation. They don't see the deterioration in every area of their life. The workaholic sees their contribution to the family, not the fact that there's a void there. The person who leaves, well, they need their space, but they don't see that there's something left behind, hurting, painful people. The, uh, the perfectionist, they don't see themselves as perfectionists. They're just God's quality control officers. Uh, God isn't pointing them to point out things that need to be better, and they don't see the tyranny that they put all of us under. The love addict sees the romance, but not that the compulsion is putting them in relationships with something sick, and they'd rather be with something sick than with nothing at all. Christian um, denial says, well, you know, we shouldn't have these uh, problems, or I've, I've been delivered. I've never known anybody delivered from something that was delivered into character or maturity. Because God has a process of sanctification that he wants to put us all through. We're going to have some new groups here. My wife's going to lead one on Sunday night for women. And, and, and it's a time to deal with resentments and comparisons and how we make unhealthy choices. And men, there's going to be an every man's battle group to look at how we get so locked into intensity and we miss the intimacy that God has called us to and how we're destroying that potential. You know, um, the second big lie is that it does no good to look back or to look inside. But 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, let's examine ourselves and see if our faith is genuine. Test yourselves, and we need to do that. So to that end, in your little program there, I've got some tools for you. And the first tool is this. It's a chair. And so you need to find a chair and relax to take time to heal. Don't just rush from one thing to the next. Develop that reflective life. And it's a great time and a great place for you to put some truth into your life. There are a lot of Bibles over there in the bookstore. There are three that I edited. One is Every Man's Bible. That's the best-selling men's Bible. And there's the Spiritual Renewal Bible. If you don't like 12 steps, um, well, here's seven keys on transformation. And then... This Bible is the best-selling adult study Bible, and it's a recovery Bible. It's all about the 12 steps. And any of these Bibles can help us find a way to get God's truth into our lives so that we're living according to the true truth. And then another tool is the brain. We need to reflect back on the impactful events of our lives. And when we do that, you know, maybe we discover we're not quite over it. Maybe we've made some, um, some amazing vows to never do this, never trust this person, or never get involved with that, or some conclusions about people that we need to deal with. And then this little balloon here, these conversation balloons, remind us that we need to review our conclusions with a trusted resource. We need people to come alongside, and we need to have some, some help and some conversations that might be healing. James 5.16 says, 
Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. It's the most specific verse on healing I know of. Next week, John Townsend wrote the book Boundaries. He's going to be here to talk about connections and healing. It'll be fantastic. But so often we don't have anybody that's helping us or we're not open and it's not healing. This woman was walking along and she saw these two little girls and they were both crying their eyes out. One held a doll and it was obviously broken. The woman said, what's going on? What, why are you guys crying? And the little girl that didn't have the doll said, this is my friend. And she broke her doll and I'm just here helping her cry. Wow, what a sweet thing. We need somebody to help us cry. Not just to move on, not to say something stupid, but to just be there and help us cry. What a great thing. You know, I, I've included a, a magnifying glass. Sometimes we need to do that inventory. We need to use whatever tool we can to search deeper into the truth because sometimes we have a story, but it's not the story. There are things we need to discover. We need to ask some people. We need to find a resource. And maybe even in a life group, you can do that. Because sometimes we need to, and this is the final tool, we need to reframe our lives based on true truth. This could be either the top of a mountain range or some houses or little monopoly, little plastic houses, just depending on how big the frame is. And sometimes we need a new frame to see the reality of our lives. I was doing a workshop, and this man came in one morning, and he was very upset. And I asked him, what was the problem? He said, um, my mother called me. I've never talked to my mother my whole life, and she found my phone number, and she called me last night. She wants to be part of my life, but she wasn't there. She left me on the neighbor's doorstep and went on to live her life, and now she wants some kind of relationship, and I'm furious. Well, a couple of times in my life, I've had the right thing to say, so I, I said to him, I said, you know, maybe, maybe if you just called her tonight and ask her to tell you about her childhood, you might discover some truth that you don't, you don't know. So he comes back the next morning. He was not upset at all. In fact, he looked like he was in a pretty good mood. I said, so did you call? He said, yes, I did. I said, what did you discover? He said, my mother told me about my grandmother. My grandmother was schizophrenic. And when she had my mother, she went into a postpartum depression. She was going to kill my mother. But instead of killing my mother, she took her next door to the neighbor and left her on the doorstep. My mother was raised by these people. They told her that story so that when my mother had me and went into this postpartum depression, she did what her mother did to save my life, she left me. But with my mom, her mother never came back, but my mom, she wants a relationship with me because they developed medication that helped her with her problem. And now she's not in an institution and she wants to have a life with me. You see, he had a story of an abandoning, evil mother who wasn't there, but in reality, in the midst of all of her sickness, she cared enough to preserve his life in the only way that she knew how. So often, we don't have the entire story, and we need to reframe the story. My boy Solomon, he reads Greek mythology. He's a little, he's got my wife's IQ, a little genius. And I said, well, are any, any of those Greek people in there, uh, did any of them discover some stuff that they were kind of surprised at? He said, oh, absolutely, Persephone. I go, oh, yeah, Persephone, like I knew who she was. He said, she thought the whole world revolved around her, and she was really shocked when she discovered it wasn't so. I said, oh, Persephone, like 
person, like all of us, we do the same thing. We discover the world is not revolving around us, and the question is, what are we going to do once we realize it's not about us? Psalm 119.29 says, keep me from lying to myself. And we do that. We say, oh, it's not that bad. One of my favorite, this isn't really hurting anyone. It'll get better over time. You really shouldn't deal with that stuff. Let's just keep moving forward. All those excuses and lies that we tell ourselves keep us stuck. And if we don't do something, we get worse or we miss all of this stuff that God has in store for us. This, this life that's absolutely fantastic, but we're just stuck and we're holding on and we got to do something. There was this golfer. He thought he was really good, and he goes out to tee off one day. And so he gets up there, and he tees off and kind of skirts across the top of the ball. It rolls about 10 feet right up on top of an ant bed. He is furious. And so he just swings that club and misses the ball, wipes out about 300 ants. It was a horrible ant massacre that day on that ant hill. Oh, now he's really mad, and he swings again, another three to 500 ants dead, just like that. These two little ants walk out there, <laughs> they look up, and they go, we're going to die if we don't get on the ball. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? That's my big theological truth. We're going to die if we don't get on the ball. We've got to do something. God is inviting us to make some choices. Now, one of my favorite verses, and, and we'll close with, with this and a little reading we're going to do together. But it says in Romans 12, 2, that, that don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, in your bulletin, you've got a thing that's called a daily affirmation. Now, I wrote this. I put it in the back of healing as a choice, and I challenged people to read this for 40 days and see if it doesn't help to change their thinking. Now, this is long. It's the last thing we're going to do. We're going to read this together, okay? So I want you to really gear up for this. Don't, don't drop out because I want you to read some of this stuff and be asking yourself, is there something in here that I don't think or I'm not living by because this is God's true truth? So are you ready? Here we go. Today, I choose to heal. My healing begins right now in this moment. I am no longer bound by my sick past. There is healing in my future. For the next 24 hours, I choose to live free and heal. I choose to let go of past hurts I cannot undo. I choose to forgive myself for wrong choices in the past. Today, I will dwell on what is good and right, not on the darkness I have experienced or the darkness others invite me to live. Today, I will live beyond myself and live for God. On this day, I will choose to feel my life rather than live in denial. I will not medicate away my pain, sorrow, or anxiety. I will allow each negative feeling to lead me to greater depths of healing. I will not drown out or ignore my negative emotions. I will work through these feelings and move out of them. I will not project them onto those around me. When I'm unaware of what choice to make next, I will choose to do the next right thing. Today, I will not hide or run away. I will connect with those who love me and those who need my love. Throughout this day, I will stay connected to God and ask him to guide and lead me. Today will be an adventure for me. I will take a risk and enjoy the unpredictable. I will not be governed by my fears I will choose to do something uncomfortable that might lead me to know the truth about myself or live life to the fullest. I will not lie to myself today. I will seek the truth and ask for help when I need it. I will reestablish boundaries that will protect me from unhealthy people and unhealthy situations. I will tear down walls that are keeping wonderful people from knowing and loving me. If there is some ungrieved loss, I will grieve it as much as I can today and then put it away. Today, I will choose reality and embrace it. I will accept and pick up my life right where it is. I refuse to wallow in self-pity. 
I will not focus on what I do not have or what might have been. On this day, I will not give up. No matter how difficult the struggle, I choose to persevere. I will not let any excuse be strong enough to derail my path to healing. I will never give up or give in to an old life that did not serve me well. I will allow no one to discourage me. Today, I will heal and rely on God to deliver me through the choices I make. Today, I will allow God to control my life. I will make each choice with God in mind and love in my heart. On this day, I choose healing. I will do what I can to heal and accept the limitations God has placed before me. I will see every limitation I encounter as an invitation by God to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I will accept that healing is sometimes slow and delayed, and I will grow in character in the meantime. Today, I will step outside of myself and serve others. I will find a need and fill it. I will find the hurt of another and help heal it. I will not become self-absorbed or filled with self-obsession. I will reach out to someone in need and do what I can to meet that need. Today, I will ask for God's help to live out his purpose. Today, I will live for God and not myself. Today, I choose to live. Today, I choose to love. Today, I choose to heal. God has an amazing transformation for every person here, no matter what it is that you're going through. Everybody's got something. That's what I know. And I hope and pray that this, this day begins something new for you. And for the rest of the day, I hope it's really super. Boy, God bless you. <laughs>